Good evening and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier and it's a great pleasure for me to have you all here this evening. I serve as director of the library here in Ann Arbor and also of the museum in Grand Rapids. We're very pleased to have you here tonight. Tonight's program is being taped by Michigan Productions for later broadcast on Ann Arbor Cable. When we get to the Q&A session following our talk, we'd appreciate it if you would go to the microphone at the back of the center aisle so that when you ask your question, it can be recorded on the video and every future watcher will, will know what we were talking about tonight. And one item of housekeeping, if you have a cell phone with you, would you please turn it off at this time? And that includes our speaker, too. <laughs> This evening's program is brought to you by the National Archives and Records Administration with very significant support from the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. <coughs> we are very pleased that the Executive Director of the Foundation, Joe Calvaruso, is able to be with us tonight. Joe, would you rise and take a, take a bow? Before introducing our speaker, I'd like to also introduce a very special guest who is visiting the library for the first time. Dr. Jim Gardner is the new executive for Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries, and Museum Services at the National Archives. In short, he is our boss, and we are very pleased to have him on board. Jim came to the National Archives from the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History, where he was senior scholar overseeing collections and research planning, and previously associate director for curatorial affairs. Prior to joining the Smithsonian, Jim served as deputy director of the American Historical Association and director of education and special programs for the American Association for State and Local History. Thus, he has a very strong knowledge of history, museums, and presidential libraries, which makes him a perfect fit for this position. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Gardner to the Ford Library. Jim, take that. We offered Jim the chance to say a few words, but he said we should focus on our distinguished journalist tonight, so we'll, we'll do that. It's a great pleasure for us to host Marvin Kalb, an accomplished journalist and author, who will discuss Vietnam's long shadow and the war's impact on U.S. foreign and military policy across seven presidents. Mr. Kalb was last here at the library in 1997 when he moderated two panel sessions at a conference called Does America Need the CIA? He was in the company then of President Ford, Secretary of State James Baker, and then CIA Director George Tennant, among others. It's a great pleasure for us to have Mr. Kalb back at the library. As many of you know, his distinguished journalism career encompasses 30 years of award-winning reporting for CBS and NBC News as Chief Diplomatic Correspondent, Moscow Bureau Chief, and anchor of Meet the Press. Currently, he uh, anchors the CALB Report, which is a program about me media ethics and responsibility at the National Press Club in Washington. In addition, he is a regular contributor to NPR radio and various television programs. He's a guest scholar in the Foreign Policy Program at the very distinguished Brookings Institution and is also the Edward R. Murrow Professor of Practice Emeritus at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He's also the author or co-author of 12 nonfiction books and two best-selling novels. In his newest book, written with his daughter, Haunting Legacy, they spent five years interviewing hundreds of officials from every a recent president in archives and presidential libraries across the country. In that process, they discovered a lot of new information and insights never before published. They present a compelling and important history of presidential decision making on a crucial issue. In light of the Vietnam debacle, under what circumstances should the United States go to war? The sobering lesson of Vietnam is that the United States is not invincible. It can lose a war, and thus it must be more discriminating about the nature and use of, of American power. As the book discusses, every president has faced the ghosts of Vietnam in his own way, though each has been wary of being sucked into another unpopular war. There have been many, many favorable press comments from other journalists about the books. I could quote with them, but I know that you would rather hear from our guest, Marvin Kelb. So please welcome him back to the Ford Library. Good 
Elaine, thank you very much, and, and thanks to everybody, and thank you all for coming on a suddenly cold evening. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be back here for a number of reasons, but one that I want to share with you straight away. I really liked Jerry Ford. I thought he was one of the nicest people I had ever met, and presidents, because of the nature of their responsibility, don't have to be nice when you have that kind of power. People do things for you because in part out of fear and in part out of respect. With Jerry Ford, you did things because you just, he asked you, so you did it. And he was the kind of guy who, um, who made you forget that he was president. And I just feel very good about being back and thank you very much uh, for having me and for giving me an opportunity to talk about haunting legacy. Uh, Elaine has already told you, Debbie and I worked on this book for five years, and it is uh, in many ways a labor of love, though it concerns a war that the United States lost. I want to start by talking about Ford, because he played a very important role at a very important moment in American history. Jerry Ford was our president when the United States lost the first war in its history. It lost that war to a country that Lyndon Johnson referred to as that raggedy-ass little fourth-rate country. But think about it. When a raggedy-ass little fourth-rate country defeats the greatest superpower on Earth, that's saying something. And that immediately does something to the body politic of a nation and to the presidency. Because it's the president who has the ultimate responsibility about sending kids off to war. And if you have just lost in a most improbable way, you have to think not only twice, but ten times about what it takes, what is involved in your decision to send young people off to fight and possibly to die. Jerry Ford was in office on April 30, 1975, when the North Vietnamese Army took over South Vietnam and won. Now we have to remember, which we tend to forget, but the United States had in Vietnam up until 1968, even at the 69, 548,000 troops. This was not a Bush League operation. This was the superpower sending more than half a million troops to a small country in Southeast Asia that it did not want to see go communist. But the communists won. So something went wrong, profoundly wrong. And Jerry Ford was in office when that question was asked and when, in a sense, the beginning of an answer had to be composed. How did he respond to it? Ford was, um, when he first started into politics, a very young, very ambitious, um, projecting a view of a very conservative politician. But in the late 1940s, Ford described the, American, the, be, the very beginning of the American effort in South Vietnam, which wasn't even South Vietnam at the time. As the U.S. was making, he said at that time to friends, a big mistake, trying to do what the French are trying to do in Indochina. And he said the French were not doing it well. So why should we be here? What makes us think that we can do it better? This was in his mind in the late 40s. In 1952, as a congressman, he went out there on one of those early congressional delegation missions. And after just three days in Vietnam, he said, the French don't know what they're doing. The, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, the exact words are in the book, but he said that they're more interested in their boots being polished 
than in understanding the nature of the war that they are fighting. In other words, Ford was very quick on picking up the fact that the French and then we were involved in something that was new to us, a guerrilla war. It should not have been new to us because we had been involved in a similar war in the Philippines right at the turn of the century. So it's not the first time we were engaged in a guerrilla war, but it's the first time that we began to recognize as the global power that we could be involved in the kind of war that our overwhelming military might might not be able to master. And Ford spotted that very early, but as a politician seeking higher office, paying his dues to the Republican Party, he decided that he would do what most other politicians did. You salute, you went with what the party leader said, and you supported the war. And that is what he did right up to the very end. My point is, he was a reluctant supporter of the Vietnam War, but he did it. When, on April 30, 75, the war ended, he had the responsibility that might be equated to that of a mortician. He had to pick up the entrails of a lost war and figure out what is, what is the American responsibility at this time. How, does, how do we act after just having been defeated? And the opportunity was presented to Ford within a matter of three weeks when a small merchant ship that many of us in this room, I can see, have enough gray hair to remember, um, was called the Mayaguez. And that ship was picked up by a number of Cambodian pirates. The pirates had been picking up ships left and right. It was not a new thing. We should not have been at all surprised by it. But Brent Skolkoff, uh, the uh, National Se Security Advisor to President Ford, came in one morning into his office. said, Mr. President, I got bad news. The Mayagas has just been picked up. He didn't know who the Mayagas was, what it was. But he was informed immediately. He said, what are we going to do? <clears throat> Instinctively, he knew there was a political problem here. And it was even more than a political problem. It was an international problem. The Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which is an excellent German newspaper, had just done a major story. It had been translated and put on the president's desk. U.S. giant question mark? In other words, after Vietnam, what were we really? And it was on Ford's mind, and he was preparing to leave for a NATO meeting in Brussels. He called the National Security Council meeting at 12 that day. His Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, pounded the table, as only Kissinger could do when he wished to put on an act. And he pounded the table and he said, Mr. President, we have to do something military. We have to make very sure that the whole world understands we are not a paper tiger. That phrase was not used accidentally. That was Richard Nixon's great line. His fear in Vietnam all the time, Nixon's, was that we, if we didn't win, we would be perceived to be a paper tiger. Ford stuck there with that responsibility, likewise didn't want to be seen as a paper tiger. So, against the challenge of the handful of Cambodian pirates, he sent an American aircraft carrier Two marine, two marine units, I forgot the exact dimension of that now, um, um, a whole bunch of airplanes. He sent two destroyers, a cruiser. He sent a huge American operation to take on the Cambodian pirates. Why? He wanted the world to see that the United States had muscle and was prepared to use that muscle. Forget that it was against the pirates. He wanted, it, he wanted, as a matter of fact, to bomb Cambodia mercilessly until the pirates gave up the ship and released the crew. Now, within a matter of three or four days, 
it was all over. The whole crisis was resolved. The crew was returned, the ship was returned, uh, the pirates didn't ask for anything special, and Ford, in a sense, won. And that was to him extremely important. And Jerry Ford was not the kind of guy who got down on his knees and prayed. But that night he did. And he prayed because he was just considered himself so fortunate that he was able to provide an image of the United States as a virile, muscular state. There were seven presidents along the way in our research. And I don't want to go through each one of the seven because it'll take too long. But with your forbearance, I'd like to deal with three of them especially, but may talk about a few others en route. And I'd like to, to go from Ford, Skip Carter, and go to Ronald Reagan. And we all remember Reagan, and we all remember what a superb politician he was, and he was a great patriot. He loved his country, and he loved to project the image of the United States as a great power. But when you read his letters, which are quite remarkable, and for those of you who have an interest in presidential letter writing, take a look at the Ronald Reagan letters. They're terrific because of several things. One, he actually wrote them himself, <laughs> number one. And number two, he took time. He spent hours writing these letters, hundreds, thousands of them. And a theme that emerges from many of the letters is the following. He believed that the Vietnam War essentially robbed the presidency of a degree of its power. And that the president, no matter who it is, Democrat or Republican, would never again be able to reacquire that kind of power. That the Vietnam War had a terrible impact on the U.S. and especially on the presidency. He used the word spooked time and time again to define the attitude of the American people toward the war. In many letters, you'd find him saying that the Vietnam War has spooked my people, spooked the American people. So jump ahead now to October 1983. And many of you in this room will remember the news bulletin that 241 American Marines were blown up and killed in their barracks in Beirut, Lebanon. 241 Marines killed as a result of one terrorist attack. Some 40-odd French troops were killed uh, about 40 minutes later in another part of Beirut. They were also part of an international peacekeeping force. What is it that Reagan did? The most natural thing you would assume that someone like Reagan 241, not ordinary guys, Marines, are killed. What do you do? Number one, who did this? The CIA knew exactly who did it. Not only that, they knew exactly where they were. They knew the hotels that they were in, in Baalbek, Lebanon. So Reagan had every opportunity for what was called a direct targeted bombing of getting the bad guys. But he worried about collateral damage, and he worried about the American people being spooked by Vietnam, and he didn't want to put them into a position, once again, of being in a war for which there was no real contour. There was no end to this kind of engagement. That if he put soldiers into Lebanon, how long would they be there for? How many would you need? Could you really accomplish your purpose? And Reagan pulled back. He was very lucky because at the very same time that that happened, the United States invaded Grenada. We won, by the way. We won. 
We took Grenada overnight. It was in our hands. And what the White House did was push that story right up to the front. And the Secretary of State at that time, George Shultz, said at a news conference, he said this with a straight face, by the way, that we have now, um, I think he used the word, occupied Grenada. The bad guys, my words, are in control. We've got them now. And we are in charge there. And this shows that the United States of America is now back. The Vietnam War is behind us. We don't have to worry about that anymore. We have reemerged. We are a great power. Hip, hip, hooray. No reporter asked him at that news conference about what was going on in Lebanon. Astounding. Astounding. They didn't ask him, and he didn't volunteer anything because the White House effort was to put Lebanon to one side and focus on Grenada. Within three months, President Reagan decided to pull all forces out of Lebanon. We have since paid a terrible price for that decision because that decision put into the minds of people like Nasrallah, who runs Hezbollah in Lebanon, that if you, he has said this, by the way, if you bloody the Americans, they'll withdraw. So the lesson that the bad guys picked from the killing of 241 Marines, you bloody the U.S., they'll get out. And that is indeed what Reagan did. He did it, though, because of Vietnam. But the response, the consequence was that it left this bad message among many of the Islamic fanatics, which we continue to have trouble with these days. The next president I'd like to deal with is President George H.W. Bush, Bush I. If there is one president who had the most professional grasp of the use of American power, it was Bush I. He was surrounded by a superb team of people, and he had a Rolodex because of his vast experience uh, prior to becoming president. He had a Rolodex filled with the names and phone numbers of people all over the world whom he could call. And in his mind, the essential thing when Saddam Hussein sent his troops from Iraq into Kuwait, that was in the summer of 1990, Bush was torn, in fact, because of Vietnam, and he wrote this. He's also a great letter writer, by the way. Republican presidents are very good letter writers. <laughs> They're really good. The Democrats are not as good in that. Um, what, what Bush once said in any number of his letters was he, too, because of Vietnam, he was very explicit, because of Vietnam, uh, and he made even poetic allusions to Banquo's ghost uh, on the ramparts looking down at our decision-making process. He was very conscious of Vietnam, and he kept on saying to friends and to Brent Scowcroft, his national security advisor, began telling people consistently, there is no question that we can send in troops and beat the Iraqis. That was never a military issue. However, should I? How many troops do I send? For what length of time? All of the issues, the so-called lessons of Vietnam, were very much in Bush's mind. He decided to do it in part, in part, because Maggie Thatcher, of Great Britain, in her final days in office, said, don't get wobbly on us, George. She wanted him to have a steel spine. And she also wanted him to demonstrate that the bad guys around the Middle East are not going to win. And the only people on this planet who had the military power to stop them were the Americans. 
And so the Americans ought to be there, ought to use their military, and ought to stop them. And if you go ahead, George, I'll be right behind you, and we'll provide British backup support. For that reason, and also the fact that as Secretary of State Jim Baker, Brent Scowcroft, National Security, um, Kissinger, by the way, on the side, urging the same kind of action, all were saying, Mr. President, you must demonstrate to, this, to these people that they can't get away with this stuff. Also, they worried a great deal about Saddam Hussein thinking that he had the early version of weapons of mass destruction. So Bush decided to go in. Now, there was such a thing called the Powell Doctrine. I urge you all to reread it if you haven't read it in recent years. Not a long thing, just a couple of pages. And what it says in effect, Powell Doctrine, by the way, comes out of the direct recommendation of President Reagan to his, to his Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberg, who did the first version of the Powell Doctrine at the National Press Club in 1984. And Powell rewrote it. And by the time he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the tail end of the 18 of the 1980s into the 1990s, it was already a formulated doctrine, and Bush one bought into it 100%. And what it said was, all in response to the Vietnam War, one, if you're going to send troops anywhere, you have to have the support of the American people. Two, they have to have a clear military strategy and purpose. In other words, you don't go in to sort of feel your way around. You go in in order quickly to do the job with overwhelming military force. If you need 100,000 people to do the job, send 200,000. Overwhelming military force. Have an exit strategy. Know when you're getting out. Don't get sucked in to a war and then find yourself there year after year after year. Unacceptable to the American people, who are very impatient. And Bush kept on saying to all of the people at, at his National Security Council meetings, kept on going back to the Powell Doctrine, and Powell, of course, was sitting there beaming <laughs> because he was very happy that the president bought into his ideas. And, and, in, and the president did 100% we didn't send forces in until the beginning of 1991 to kick the Iraqi troops out of Kuwait. But it was a marvelous exercise by General Powell in the way in which you manipulate a president. In October of 1990, Powell, desiring not to frighten anybody on the National Security Council, um, responded to the president's question, how many troops do we need, General? Powell said, 120,000, Mr. President. The president thought for a second, and he said, done. Then the next meeting they had, there was a serious build-up meeting, was at the very beginning of December of 1990. There was a big debate taking place at the UN. How many troops do you need, General? He said, well... You know, when you consider the possibility that we have to also protect Saudi Arabia and maybe there would be a flanking move into Jordan, I, I think we ought to go to 250, Mr. President. <laughs> 250,000, I think, is what we need. There was a bit of a gasp in the room, but they all bought it. 250 was going to be. The beginning of January, the president said, General, 250? He said, well, to be absolutely safe, Mr. <laughs> President, 500,000. And that is exactly what Bush sent. On an assumption that if the United States is going to go to war, it's not going to be another Vietnam. We're not going to get trapped into an endless battle in a, in a territory we don't control. In a new kind of war, we're going to have overwhelming force. We're going to go in quick. We're going to get out quick. We know it, and they're going to know it. 
It was a 100-hour war, at the end of which it was very clear that we had a straight run up to Baghdad and we could get rid of Saddam Hussein completely. That was in February and March of 1991. Bush one thought about it quite seriously, but then almost all of his advisors, led by Brent Scowcroft, said no. Why? Because, Mr. President, if we go on up, there's no question from a military point of view we can get there and we can kick him out. But who then runs Iraq? Well, we'd have to be there for a while, wouldn't we? Yes, well, how long? How many troops would you need? And Bush began to ask every right question until he persuaded himself that it was absurd to go any further. We accomplished our purpose. We got the Iraqi troops out of Kuwait, go home. And that's exactly what he did. That was the perfect um, implementation of the Powell Doctrine. Since that time, presidents have dealt with the Powell Doctrine, but they have been afraid of the consequences. And when Bush one finished the war, he said, sadly as it turned out, well, we have now buried Vietnam in the sands of Arabia. We don't have to worry about it anymore. The ghosts of Vietnam have been expunged. No. The next president I want to deal with is our current president. And in our Q&A period, by the way, if you want to ask about the others, you're more than welcome to. But I want to spend a little more time on Obama because he's our guy. He's the one we have right now. And the first thing to be said ob about Obama and Vietnam is that he was 13 years old on April 30, 1975. He had nothing to do with the Vietnam War. He didn't fight there. He didn't run away from it. His uh, father wasn't involved in it. He had nothing to do with it. In other words, he carried no Vietnam baggage. And yet... The nature of the man, he is very bright, uh, very quick-minded. He reads a lot of history. And he's very well aware of the power of Vietnam to influence American presidents. When he was running for office in 2008, one of the best stories about him is that he took the obligatory visit to the battlefield. He went to Afghanistan to see how the troops were doing. The flight over from Andrews Air Force Base to Kuwait City is a 14-hour flight. He took two colleagues along from the Senate. One of them was Chuck Hagel, a Republican from Nebraska, and the other is Jack Reed, a Democrat from Rhode Island. Hagel had fought in Vietnam, been on two missions there, received two Purple Hearts, two medals for bravery. He knew what the war was about. Jack Reed had not fought uh, in Vietnam. He had been, in 1975, he finished West Point. And he was very much involved then with the new generation of military people who were going to take over in the post-Vietnam environment. 14 hours, three men. I mean, how much scotch can you drink? <laughs> the Obama asked them questions in 14 hours on only one subject. They were going to Afghanistan. One subject was Vietnam. Over and over again, Obama pumped the two senators one question after another about Vietnam. What did Johnson do that was so wrong? Was Nixon right in beginning the withdrawal of forces before we had an agreement with the North Vietnamese? What was the fundamental mistake that was made by President Kennedy? He kept asking these questions. And for 14 hours, that's all they talked about, Vietnam. 
When Senator Obama then returned to continue his presidential campaign, the first stop he made was the Veterans of Foreign Wars in Miami, Florida, big annual convention. Senator McCain had just spoken the day before, laced into Obama, called him, um, a couple of things were absolutely accurate, totally inexperienced, um, both in politics and in the military, knowing nothing about the military. And the following day when Obama spoke, almost of necessity moved by the pressures of presidential politics, he said that the war in Afghanistan is a war of necessity, one that the United States must win. Once he said that, that was the headline in the paper the next day, and once he said that, that was Obama's mantra. Obama, Afghanistan must win. The first serious decision that Obama made as President of the United States concerned Afghanistan. On the first day in office, he received a report from the CIA, direct from Kabul, in which the message was crystal clear. Without an immediate and dramatic infusion of American forces, Afghanistan is lost to the Taliban. So the minute Obama comes into office, the black shadow of another military defeat on the United States is on his desk, and he has to make a decision. And Obama, because of his grasp of history, could immediately recall 1949 and Richard Nixon saying of Harry Truman after communist China, after the communists took over in China, who lost China? You remember that was a big a question with huge political implication. And Obama was already thinking, who lost Afghanistan? So almost immediately he sent 17,000 additional troops. In other words, you face the war, you're walking in, you're brand new on the job, you have an obligation to be consistent with what you said during the campaign. But you also have an even larger obligation as President of the United States to do the right thing based on your best judgment as a President. And Obama felt he had no choice. He had no military experience, liberal Democrat, he would be leaped on by every Republican, and the Democrats wouldn't win the White House for another 50 years. And he was driven immediately to make the decision on sending another 17,000. Within a matter of seven months after that decision, he sent an additional 33,000, moving American force levels to double where they had been when he came into office. He went up to 100,000 troops. Um, a president is the prisoner of circumstance, but also the prisoner of his own words. They become his policy. And if we can't win and you send in the troops, you are then the owner of the war. You didn't start it, but you own it. And the minute blood is shed on your watch, it then becomes your responsibility to vindicate the shedding of the blood. And Obama, since he came into office, is a man of two minds. There's a large part of him that says, let me out of here. I don't want this. It's not good for the country and it isn't good for me. Let me out of here. But there's the other part of him, as president, he listens to the generals, and by the way, there's a great story when he, at his first, uh, not National Security Council meeting, but his first meeting devoted exclusively to Afghanistan. Of course, all of the Pentagon generals arrived, and 
It's a very impressive bunch. I mean, I have enormous regard for the American soldier today, and particularly the high-ranking guys. And they walked in with all of the medals on their chests, and big, strong guys. And Obama had, t had told one of his principal political advisors, I am not going to be snowed by these guys. I am not going to be snowed by these guys. And so he went in thinking, you know, Barack Obama, I was there at the Harvard Law Review, I know what I can do and all that. <laughs> but these are generals. They had faced death. And they're coming back and they're saying to him now, this is a war we can win if you give us the troops to do it. Both sides of him have been in conflict from day one. He doesn't want to lose the war. But at this particular point, there is no longer any discussion of his winning the war. Now what you have is an unhappy twilight zone where everybody in the area is convinced that the United States wants to get out of there and will. And there are dates. December 2014 is when the combat operations for the U.S. and for all of NATO, according to the Lisbon Agreement of, of December uh, 2010, that we're out. So put yourself right now in, in the Taliban's position. Number one, militarily, you've been hurt. You've been hurt bad because the U.S. military does some pretty terrific things. So you've been hurt. Two, there is still no government in Kabul that has the allegiance of the Afghan people, and it is drenched in corruption. So in the Taliban, we think about these things, and can we get these guys? Yeah, probably, yeah. There are polls that indicate that the Afghan people don't like the Taliban but they are afraid of them because the Taliban, when in power, was merciless. Merciless. Cruel, cruel government. The third element, which is almost beyond the capacity of the U.S. to do anything about, and that is Pakistan. Pakistan is right next door, and the Taliban can cross the line after a battle, go back into Pakistan, and we can't go after them. There's no troops on the ground that you can get in there. When the U.S. killed Osama bin Laden, it was a secret operation, and the Afghans were furious that we had done it. They say it was good that we killed them, but it was bad that we trespassed on their sovereignty. What does Vietnam have to do with this, and why the legacy? Because in every way, every lesson of Vietnam is being turned on its head right now. Not because the president wants to, but because he feels he has no option except to act in a certain way. And that is what he is trying to do. He is kicking the can down the road. There is no way the U.S. is going to win in Afghanistan whatever that verb might mean. So you have to get out with some kind of dignity. And here you go back to Richard Nixon at the tail end of the Vietnam War, which President Ford oversaw the end of. Richard Nixon said to Henry Kissinger, the first time they had a serious meeting in December of 1968 when Nixon was elected and Henry Kissinger was appointed as National Security Advisor. First thing he said to him was, Henry, you and I both know that we cannot win in Vietnam, but we cannot tell the American people that. We have to search for an honorable exit from the war. Now, it ought to be stated very quickly that after he made that statement that we cannot win, 28,000 American soldiers died in pursuit of a policy aim 
that was totally empty. 28,000. The total loss was 58,000 American troops in Vietnam. So what Nixon was trying to do was pull down our force levels from 548,000 in in Vietnam, pull it down gradually, starting in the summer of 1969. And as you pull them down, we negotiate a big deal with the Chinese here and the Russians there. And we miniaturize Vietnam. We turn it into dust. It becomes nothing on the diplomatic uh, map. It's zero. And look how clever I am. I'm pulling out. It reduces casualties. The anti-war demonstrations on the college campuses stop. The country sort of comes together behind me. We send more money in planes to the South Vietnamese. They're our guys. We train them. So we leave. They take over. And we have an honorable exit from Vietnam. It never happened. Obama, Afghanistan, today. What do we do? We had 100,000. We're now at 89,000. At the end of September, it will be 68,000. And then the battle will begin again. Do we continue to lower the number? Or do we keep it at 68,000 while we attempt to negotiate our way out? But the parallels between Vietnam and Afghanistan are uncannily similar. And if I may repeat here um, something that is central to any understanding of what, it, it, what is going on at the White House now is everyone understands what happened in Vietnam. I don't want to say this happens often. It happens, though, that Obama will, on his own, pop into the office of one of his advisors, sit on the advisor's desk, look at him, and sort of be a very thoughtful guy, and he would think and say, do you think that we're screwing up the way Johnson did? Do you think we're making the same mistakes? He is obsessed by that question of the errors of Vietnam being superimposed now on the current situation. And I think that it is sad, truly, that we are at this moment in our history because we are absorbed with so many other large problems, starting with the economy, including Iran and the Middle East and Pakistan and all that stuff. You would think that a president ought to have the time, the luxurious time, truly to consider what is best for the country. Um, But I don't think that Obama has that time. He's in the midst of a re-election campaign. The American people are anxious to get out. The latest poll is that 67% of the American people want us out of Afghanistan. They see no point to it. And let me close uh, before we go to questions and just tell you a a very personal thing. I am a watcher of of what used to be the Jim Lehrer News Hour. It still is the News Hour. And you, you know that every two or three weeks at the end of the program, they run pictures of the American soldiers who've been killed. And up until about two or three months ago, like I think most people who would watch the program, I continued to sit there at home and watch the program. And then either turn off the television set or watch something else. But lately, the message, the power of the message of Afghanistan and the legacy, the haunting legacy of Vietnam is such that I find myself instinctively, I don't even do it consciously, but I stand up um, when I look at these faces. And I ask myself, for what? 
Why? And I, I, you know, you can, I guess the only thing you do is write another book. Anyway, thank you all very much. You've been very, very kind to listen. Oh, it's a wonderful question, and thank you for it. Um, one of the difficulties that Obama, one of the, um, one of his problems is that though intellectually he understands the lessons of Vietnam very well, on the practical side of running policy, he can say to himself, Maybe there is a logic, Mr. President, in pulling out now, just getting out, telling the American people and the world, we've done the best we can, and now we leave. But he is a president, and he's running for re-election, and he does not want to be defeated. And he feels very strongly that if the image be conveyed, as it would be, unmistakably, by his Republican opponent, that like all of the Democrats, they fold when the pressure is too great. They don't know truly how to run our foreign policy. They don't understand military force. Um, he cannot have that happen. He has said to himself, I cannot allow Afghanistan to go down the drain even if he knows that may be the case. What's, what's so incredibly interesting, and I urge you, if you have this opportunity, talk to the American soldiers who have come back from Afghanistan, those who have had any level of responsibility. Ask them what they think about the war. I mean, after all, they're the ones who are fighting it. It's less than 1% of the American people of fighting for the other 99%. Let us bear in mind, we got a volunteer army, they volunteer to fight, and they are a masterful fighting force. But they are asked to do more than fight. They're asked to build a democracy. They're asked to do things that no fighting force has ever been asked to do. Um, and Obama does not want to be saddled with a defeat. It's that simple. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your time coming back to Ann Arbor. Um, I've had a question for not nine years that I haven't been able to get an answer to. Um, in March of 2003, I was the regimental surgeon for 7th Marines. Um, not a surgeon, family physicians, but surgeons with the Marines call every physician. Um, very well orchestrated march to Baghdad. And I have a question basically about Bush too. You said Bush won. The reason he didn't go to Baghdad was because then you have to go there and now you're gonna take over you have to plan to take over the country. Yeah. <clears throat> so can you tell me any clue why as this well orchestrated march to Baghdad where we were getting, you know, instructions from above continuously, stop, go, you know, pause. We get to Baghdad and there's dead silence from above. So I don't we, follow you. What do you mean dead silence? Well, if we've no, we have instructions the entire time. As, as Marines, we fought our way to Baghdad. Right. And so we get there, and suddenly there's like, it's almost like we surprised. You're talking about 2003 now, right? 2003, right. yes. Okay. So we took Baghdad. We've been instructions from above the entire time. It seemed like we surprised our own government that we got to Baghdad. Because there's suddenly silence 
and we had no more further directions from above, and nobody was in charge. And so what Marines do, what Marines do is my CEO comes over to me and says, you know, hey, Doc, you're now in charge of health for Iraq. Right. And um, <laughs> needless to say, I checked my Harrison textbooks, and running a country's medical system was not in any of my textbooks. <laughs> but what did Bush, too, think about the consequences of what to do once the military was successful? Because everybody knew we would be. But it seemed like there was just no plan once we got there. Well, there was no plan. Oh, um, <laughs> well, let me, hang on a sec, hang on a sec. There was a plan, but there wasn't. Let me explain that. Defense Secretary Rumsfeld had a plan when the invasion took place. And when the U.S. got to Baghdad, there was then an operating assumption that by September 15th, the U.S. will be pulling out of Iraq. In other words, Rumsfeld believed that the strategy that had been employed at the very beginning of the Afghan war could be applied as well in Iraq. What happened in Afghanistan, the Taliban's in power, we bomb, and we come in with 4,000 special forces, no big army. And this is very interesting. Uh, when Bush II took over, the governing philosophy of the White House was ABC, anything but Clinton. And if Clinton was impressed by the Powell Doctrine, and he was, we're not going to be. So we're going to prove that you don't need 500,000 troops to do something. We can do it with 4,000. And we did. We got rid of the Taliban with 4,000 and the very intelligent use of the local forces. So Rumsfeld believed and persuaded Bush, too, that that would be the case. That if we go in, we go up into Baghdad, we take it. Then it is simply a matter of holding on to it for a couple of months, and then we get out. In that couple of months, the new Iraqi government takes over. There was a slight omission on our part. We didn't have a new Iraqi government. And then we were paralyzed by our own philosophical beliefs that it's not for us, the invading Americans, to come in with a new government. The Iraqis had to do that. So we began, you, you remember this, we began to deal with one Iraqi and another Iraqi, this, that, and the other, and we're telling each one of them, take over. It's your country. And they couldn't. And they couldn't for a whole lot of reasons. And then we were, we were there. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Marvin, for such a relevant explanation of what's been the adult lifetime of everybody in this room. I wish there were more young people because they don't understand what this has been about. The question that I'd like to ask is, going backwards chronologically, how much do you think the change in structure and the way that the United States manages to get into wars no one else does, and that they aren't defined, just as you explained, is a factor of, of all of what you've done your search on? Well, um, there's a very interesting, large philosophical slash political issue at work here. As I said, as you all know, we have a volunteer army. A volunteer army goes to war when the president, as commander-in-chief, tells it to go to war. When you have a drafted army, you are drafting the whole country with you. You are bringing along with you the fears and the feelings of the entire people. A volunteer army gives the president the ability, the freedom, to go to war much more easily. Point number two, the last time this country had a declaration of war was on December 8th, 1941. We have been in many, many wars since then. We have had no other declarations of war. We have had 
Linda Johnson was very big on this. We have had congressional resolutions approving the use of force in one country after another. That's not the same as a declaration, far from it. It's um, in a way easy for a congressman or a senator to say yes if he knows that you know, he's surrounded by lots of other yes votes. So the answer to your question really is that the very nature of the way in which we get into war has now become almost the personal prerogative of the president without a need necessarily to bring the country along with him. Now you try, you make a speech, um, you bring reporters in and give them all kinds of documents that they run with, but it's not the same as a declaration. And I think that there has been a, uh, a shift um, in war making capacity to the president that was never intended. Never intended. And right now we go to war when the president, for whatever reason, I mean, people have been arguing to this day, why did Bush II take on the war in Iraq? Why? And, you know, psychology people have told you that his father didn't do it, so he's going to do it, and all that. Um, he felt that, I think he felt that there were weapons of mass destruction, and we had to stop it. <laughs> Thank you very much for a fine piece of journalism and scholarship. I hope I can go home and download this onto my Kindle right away. <laughs> Thank um, you, sir. I wonder about maybe a lesson that has not been learned, about the dangers of lying a country into a war. We were lied into the war in Vietnam. Uh, LBJ told us that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was an in unprovoked attack on our destroyers. It was certainly not unprovoked. Uh, Bush, too, told us that uh, over and over again that uh, Saddam and 9-11 were connected. Uh, the war of ma uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, that was a great intelligence failure. Uh, everybody believed they were there. But, but, the, but the lie was 9-11 and Saddam Hussein. Uh, we haven't learned that the president should not lie us into a war. I would, um, I think I would differ with you, sir, most respectfully. My experience is that um, presidents don't like to lie. Uh, they do lie, but they don't lie with pleasure. And they don't lie to get us... Um, I believe that presidents think they are shading the truth, but not lying. <laughs> and that they are shading the truth because they believe it to be in the national interest of the country that we do certain things. I, I have more respect for presidents, even those I have very little use for. But um, I don't think that they wittingly, you know, get into wars. I don't, think, I don't think most presidents want a country to go to war. Because, again, the blood is on your conscience and on your record. And you have to justify that. Wars can be fought, but they have to be justified at the end. Was it worthwhile to lose in Vietnam 58,000 Americans and an estimated 2 million Vietnamese? We forget about them, right? So we focus just on the 58,000 Americans. What came out of that? What came out of that is that right now the United States is dancing through hoops to make love to Vietnam. And, by the way, the Vietnamese as well, to the Americans. Is that why the 58,000 died? Can't be. So 
A president has to have that in mind. You've got to have the next day in mind. What is the explanation for this? And so I don't think they, they lie, but they do feel the need to shave the truth. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. I'd like to also uh, add my thanks to your coming today. Uh, but isn't the real message of Vietnam, political message, never go to war with a draft army? You never go to war with a draft army. Um, America, well, we had gone that. to war with draft armies before. Never since Vietnam. Not to Vietnam, that's true. We that's only right. there once. Um, I think the question that you're raising really um, has to do with the value of a volunteer force. And it has great value, but it does have problems. Likewise, a draft has great value because it becomes a national operation rather than a very selective operation. That's what I meant, a draft army. Yeah. And I would put it in... in different terms, and I've struggled with this question for a long time. I would love to see, I would love to see some form of national service. I don't know quite what I mean by that in explicit terms, but I do mean that every American ought to feel an obligation to give back something to his country. Something. Um, work as a nurse somewhere, work as a teacher somewhere. That's not the issue. The issue is not what the individual gives back, it's the pain that their families feel and the political pressure that you cannot as a politician withstand if you take a draft army into a lie. Okay, sir. Maybe it's a good issue, but no politician today has the guts to raise that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for the five years of dedication that you put into this book. Um, I haven't finished it. I did download it on my Kindle. I don't know how you're going to sign that, so I'm waiting to see. <laughs> my question is somewhat related. I grew up during the Vietnam era and the Watergate era, and I came to respect a fourth presumed area of government, the media, as something of um, an entity that was a watchdog. And now, if you ask people in Egypt or people in Libya, there seems to be a whole different bent on that area of media. I respect your journalism immensely and many other journalists. If you look at the Detroit News and think about people like Kwame Kilpatrick, you get a whole different vision. I'd really like to know how you feel about the emotional um, status of that haunting legacy with the new media, the new journalism that we have. A Twitter president, some would call Obama, and this may have a bearing on that. Well, uh, Obama is a Twitter president, but he does read. He reads a great deal. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't want the impression to be left that a Twitter president doesn't read that all he does is Twitter, because that's not accurate. Um, number one, thank you for your kind comments. Um, I would love to feel that the new generation of journalists would be um, perfectly capable of writing Haunting Legacy. Yeah. Why not? You put in the time, you put in the effort, you can write it. Um, there's a great deal of internal discipline involved in the writing of a book like this. And if it weren't for the determination of my daughter to finish this book after five years of work, it probably would not have been finished. But she wanted it done, and ultimately I wanted it done too. And I hope for the reason that I tried to say at the very end of my talk, and it wasn't articulated well, and I acknowledge that. But there is in history, one hopes, an answer to the question, why? Why did we go to war? What did we hope to achieve? 
was the loss of this one soldier or a hundred soldiers or a thousand worth it? Did we accomplish anything by spilling blood? We are absorbed with ourselves, but what about the people in the country that we're fighting? That's another dimension that we don't spend much time at. But they also are people deserving of, of, a, of a life within the context of their own environment. I mean, I, I am old enough and old-fashioned enough to believe that we still have an intelligent reading public, and if you give them information, they will eventually absorb it. I mean, so in my case, I, I go around, Debbie goes around, with not a, a great deal, but we do get around, mostly at universities. I'm honored to be here at a presidential library. It's sort of another level for me. But mostly at universities, we talk to students, and, you know, most of the people we talk to are 22, 23, 24 years old, graduate students. They weren't around when the Vietnam War ended. To them, it's another movie. They've seen movies about the war. They haven't really read about it. They haven't read Stanley Carnot's history of the Vietnam War. Uh, maybe one day haunting legacy in the post-war environment. There's, there are things that we have an obligation as a people to know. We are a free society. We are really a great country. We still are. And therefore, we have an obligation still to lead the world. No one else can lead the world except the U.S. There are countries that might like to, but they can't. We can, but we aren't. And the question is why? What is it about America today that makes it so difficult for it to step up to its natural position in the world. That may sound pompous in a way, and I don't mean it that way. Just analyze the countries around the world. Now, Russia is going to stand up and lead the world. They can't even run their own country. China, they're great on economic things, having their trouble now, but politically they remain an authoritarian state. India is trying, yes, but it's not a leader of the world. So who? Brazil? Maybe one day. We're it. But we're not acting as if we're it. We're beginning to act frightened. We're beginning to have second thoughts. We're beginning to wonder about ourselves and our capacity. We're not as self-confident as we were. And part of the reason is the Vietnam experience, but that's only part of it. There's a lot of other things going on as well. I didn't mean to rant, I'm sorry. I want to thank you again for your deep thought and hope that more people do that, not just Twitter or text about okay. it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is a two-part question, and it's more historical, having listened close and to, closely to your presentation, more uh, historical, uh, perhaps a little less philosophical. And it's in two parts. When I heard you speak of uh, Nixon and Kissinger and the diplomatic uh, period of time, the thought that came to mind was in Afghanistan of how the, the political and diplomatic issues with Pakistan. So I think of that as, that's the first part of the question, is there uh, an analogy, and please correct my dates or facts. And the second part of the question, to your point, has to do with the micro level and the boots on the ground. And when I heard you talk about our, the president in 2009 going from 50 to 100 to 150,000, am I correct that in that period of time, the rules of engagement for the boots became much more constrained? So the troop levels came up but they couldn't prosecute the war on the ground, similar to Vietnam. And at the same time, these troops, are, when their rules of engagement are restricted, they're still being asked to 
win the hearts and minds of the villagers or the people, just like in Vietnam. And you said there's no functional. So maybe that's a long-winded in two parts, the political diplomatic and the boots on the ground perspective. Well, the political diplomatic it is wrapped up with the military. There's no real way these days of separating it out. And if you're thinking about the current problems with Pakistan, uh, to be quite specific, Pakistan is edging toward being a dysfunctional government. It is not clear, really, who is running that place. What is clear is that Pakistan has 120 nuclear bombs in the northern part of the country, currently under the control of the Pakistani army. The Pakistani army is riddled with corruption, with, with sectarian divisions. Is it possible, even likely, that in that mess is the possibility of somebody moving in to take control of those weapons different from the formal army structure? Yes. The reason, one reason that the United States is in Afghanistan at all is that if that were to happen, we would be immediately in a position to go right in and try to retake control of those bombs. I can tell you that for quite a few years now, the biggest unspoken story in Washington has been control of the Pakistani nuclear weapons. It is only now that it's beginning on the edges to be discussed, but it is still considered a, you know, a top secret kind of thing that you don't talk about that. And one of the reasons we don't talk about it is that we're not sure yet how we would do it. Again, we, have, we, we really have a terrific army, and if you told the army, go in and take control of that part of Pakistan, they can do that. But then what do you do with it once you've got it? And that's what I meant about the political diplomatic being linked into the military. Um, the second part of your question, I think, flows right from uh, that first attempt, <laughs> attempt at an answer. I hope that's okay, but maybe you'd like to follow up on it. Just specifically, are the, are the troops on the ground, the boots in, on the ground, in, in a, the boots on the ground, yeah. an impossible situation when their well, rules of engagement are so restricted? Yeah. Well, the rules of engagement are restricted, and one of the reasons they're restricted is that we have this incredible means of communication today. Um, you know, network reporters who are not as important as the soldiers are also tied to instantaneous communication with an editor back in New York who might have had a fight uh, with his wife before leaving after breakfast that day and is in a lousy mood and tells the reporter to do something crazy. Everything is now so instantaneous that there is no time for reflection. And there's no time for reflection with respect to the soldiers or the journalists. With the boots on the ground, Bush, too, unlike Clinton, who was obsessed with no boots on the ground, Clinton wanted, uh, Bush wanted there to be boots on the ground as soon as possible. 9-11, uh, 9-12, there was a 6 p.m. meeting at the Pentagon. The president, national security team, defense department, everybody there, and the first question out of Bush's mouth, where are the troops? I want them on the ground as soon as you can get them there. Now that's another uh, sort of lesson about the uses of presidential power. Why did Bush say that? Had he been briefed that it was essential that we have boots on the ground as quickly as possible? Did he know how many boots on the ground, 
for what specific purpose? I know that that sounds like Powell Doctrine stuff, but it's important. A president can say something like that, and suddenly you put boots on the ground, and only afterward ask yourself, why did we do that? Well, the president said so. Is that good enough? Well, yes, he's the commander-in-chief. So you elect the guy, and, and you're going to ride with his judgment. All I'm trying to say is that when you deal with something like boots on the ground, wouldn't it be nice if we knew why we put them there? That's all. Yes, sir? What, this is last question. Last question. Wow. wow. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure on me. Um, thank you so much for being here. And we've covered a tremendous amount of ground and a lot of decades in history. But from the beginning, this has irked me for a long, long time, is when you said that America lost the war in Vietnam. Yes. Was it our war to win? Looking at the history of Vietnam, French Indochina, Ho Chi Minh, wasn't this their war? Wasn't this a civil war? And the answer to that is yes. It was a civil war, and was it ours to lose? I am always asked that question. Ours to win. Ours to win or lose. Um, it's very similar to when China went communist. The question at that time was asked in different ways. Um, was China ever ours to lose? Answer, no. Was Vietnam ours to lose? Answer, no. However, the very nature of American politics is that the answer is yes. When you commit American force, as Colin Powell said many times, you own it. If you break it, it's yours. You broke it. You invade it. You then own that war, and you live with it. The question about is it ours, that's all academic stuff. Put it aside. I mean, write your op-ed piece on that. But the reality is that American lives are on the line. Some of them are being lost. For what purpose? Please understand, I am not anti-war. I am anti unexplained wars, <laughs> sort of dopey wars, dumb wars. I feel that we ought to use our force, which is there, I believe, for good purpose. But use it for a good purpose. And the first purpose in the use of American military force is the protection of the United States of America. It's not, in my view, I could be dead wrong here, but in my view it is not to build democracies around the world. That's not our business. You know, if Pakistan wants to be a democracy, let it be a democracy. We can cheer from the sidelines. We can send teachers there. We can do all kinds of great things. But don't send the American army there to be a schoolmarm. That's not what it's there to do. The American army has been trained to kill. That's what a soldier does. If you don't like that, don't look. But that's what war is. It's an ugly business done in our case now by a professional army, which is first class. But it has to be assigned specific military objectives. And it'll do very well. But if you begin to send them off to you know, to cook cookies or something, it ain't going to work. So let's get focused, really. I have a question, sir. I just have a comment. The cover of your book is the Vietnam veteran is right on. Well, thank you, sir. The thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you. some fantastic speakers here and I have to say that the journalists impress me so much uh, with their knowledge of multiple presidents and Marvin Kalb is another example of that. This is simply fantastic and the book is great. We have for you a couple of pens 
with the signature I it was of cigars. Gerald. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on that. Uh, the signature of Gerald R. Ford, and maybe uh, you would wonderful. like to use one of those pens to sign a few books afterwards. I'd be delighted. I'd be honored to do so. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you.